Next, a tribute to former Senator George McGovern. Last month, the National Archives hosted a symposium on the career of the former South Dakota Senator. We'll hear from Senator McGovern, Morris Dees of the Southern Poverty Law Center, and Vern Newton, FDR Library Director. They discuss civil rights, foreign policy, and the McGovern 1972 presidential campaign. The program's about two hours. For those that are just came, we went a little over our last session, and um, uh, Bill Brands will be talking here in a minute. But we had a very interesting discussion going on in Vietnam, and George McGovern was sitting here, and we were talking uh, about two wonderful papers by Larry Berman and Bob Mann with a little different um, views, and we wanted to give Senator McGovern an opportunity to comment uh, before we get started with the next session. Senator? Well, this program has been wonderful up to this point, as far as I'm uh, concerned. I must confess, I've had times when I wondered if I was sitting through a kind of a dress rehearsal for my funeral. <laughs> but uh, the, the, uh, the difference is that uh, I can speak back so far. And uh, I, I was asked by Doug if I would just say a couple of words about the uh, papers this morning by Professor Berman, Professor Mann. I'm, I'm going to make it just very brief. There were a couple of questions raised here that uh, it might be useful for me to comment. One, Professor Berman suggested that there was a probability that we knew in the Senate, those of us who were dissenting, about the doubts that existed in the minds of Lyndon Johnson, Robert McNamara, and others, which have been coming out in recent months. The, uh, the only comment I can make on that is that I had no hint of any doubt in the minds of uh, President Johnson or uh, Secretary uh, McNamara. Quite the contrary, it always seemed to me that they were firm and unyielding and undeviating in holding to the course uh, that they had set uh, in Vietnam. I doubt if Senator Fulbright or uh, others uh, had any inkling of the degree of doubt that existed, for example, in uh, President Johnson's mind as early as 64 and 65 until these recent uh, uh, materials have been made available to us just in the last few months. I was astounded to uh, read what uh, President Johnson was saying, his dialogue with Senator Richard Russell of uh, Georgia, just as I was astounded in reading Robert McNamara's book to learn of the uh, doubts that he had uh, during this period. So I just offer that as a clarification uh, point. Um, on uh, the uh, thesis that um, Professor Mann developed briefly about <clears throat> uh, why a senator who was obviously as opposed to the war as I was was so uh, reluctant uh, to break uh, sharply and dramatically with the administration uh, on that point. I think the answer is uh, the one that Professor Berman uh, uh, suggested, that I was trying not to present a case that I thought would be uh, quickly rejected as just too far from the conventional wisdom. I've found in politics you have to do that regularly. You can't get so far out in front that you lose uh, any kind of appeal to the people you're uh, trying to influence. There was another reason for being somewhat restrained about criticism of the war in uh, 1963 and 1964. And that was my uh, conviction that uh, President Johnson was probably going to carry on the war policy until after the 1964 presidential campaign. It seemed to me at the time that was why he wanted the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, to take that issue out of the 64 uh, presidential campaign. Senator Goldwater had been hammering him for not uh, accelerating the war, especially the aerial uh, bombardment. And in the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, you had what seemed to be a shrewd uh, political move on the president's part 
to pull that issue out of partisan politics by getting us all, all of us on record on the same uh, resolution. I never saw it at the time as an endorsement of the war effort. I saw it as a, an endorsement of uh, what we were told was a measured response on the part of the Johnson administration to what we were also told was an unprovoked attack on two American uh, destroyers. We later had reason to question that. But at the time, uh, it seemed like a way to, uh, uh, in a sense, make it less uh, profitable for Senator Goldwater to go after the president on that issue. That's the way it was explained to us by Senator, Gold by Senator uh, Fulbright and others who were pressing for it on the uh, Senate floor. Um, there was also the feeling at that time that we not only wanted to do nothing that would exacerbate President Johnson's problems in the 64 presidential campaign, uh, but also a feeling that you had to kind of get the country back together after the trauma of the Kennedy assassination. Here was a, a um, experienced <clears throat> vice president suddenly uh, thrown into the presidency and a feeling that at least through the coming presidential campaign we all ought to try to get behind him. That was certainly my view as a loyal Democrat, but also as a patriotic uh, American. It seemed to me that was the course uh, to follow. And I honestly believed when we campaigned for President Johnson in 64 that he would stay with his pledge of no wider war. We're not going north. We're not going south. We're not going to send American boys to fight the battle that has to be resolved by Asian boys. I, I swallowed all of that whole. Um, I thought that I knew uh, Johnson well enough to think that his major interest was in domestic politics and the great society, and that uh, the sooner he could uh, get this war uh, behind him, the better. So I was somewhat uh, astounded when I saw evidence shortly after that landslide victory of 64 that, in fact, he was going to begin escalating the war. And that is when Senator Church and I and others became more public and more vocal, finally coming around to the position that the only way to stop this war was to terminate the uh, uh, funding uh, for it. Anyway, those are some observations that, uh, as near as I can recall, the mood of the time Hello, I'm Vern Newton, and as the uh, program notes, I'm the director of the Franklin D. Roosevelt Presidential Library and also the moderator for this afternoon panel. And just to clear up any confusion, the panel is actually beginning at the time on the program it's due to end. So uh, I don't know how Doug's going to juggle all that, but I'm sure he'll figure out a way. Uh, our panel this afternoon, uh, the first panel is on McGovern and the anti-war movement. By way of my own pedigree, I just note that some of us thought the 1972 McGovern campaign was the sequel because we were in Chicago in 1968, and uh, at the time, in the heat of all that was going on, the hope was that there was still a rational, sane alternative, and that was in the form of George McGovern, and that that would be the first ballot alternative to the Kennedy, the McCarthyites, to the uncommitted, to what we called the soft humps. And, uh, and uh, that all went up in the smoke and uh, uh, chaos and, and blood of, of Chicago, but nonetheless, it was, uh, for many of us, our first association, uh, certainly on a national scale with George McGovern and one that was very inspiring. Uh, I went on and subsequently headed up the Vietnam Moratorium Committee in New York and then um, where we used to boast that we'd print out millions and millions of leaflets and hand them out at street corners in all the five boroughs of New York and throughout the state and uh, I became convinced that in the course of that we were probably not changing a single mind and uh, my mother who was the Republican County Chairman out in Iowa once observed to me that no anti-war protester had ever handed her a, a leaflet or, any, or spoken to her about the war. So I packed my bags and moved out to Des Moines, Iowa and opened up something called the Great Plains Moratorium, uh, and, uh, which included the Dakotas and uh, Minnesota, Missouri, and Iowa. And it was a very exciting time, and there we felt we were changing uh, hearts and minds on 
on the issue of the war. But we also decided after the spring of 1970 to close the moratorium down, that it had done all that it could do. That was a, a highly debatable issue, both within the moratorium structure and from outside, and we did close it down. And a few weeks later, Nixon invaded Cambodia, and a lot of people said uh, that uh, the fact that we decided to disband the moratorium, in effect, uh, it was the green light for Nixon to invade Cambodia. I'd like to think that's true. I don't think there's any documentary evidence that there is. Uh, I don't think we ever had quite that influence. But we ended up then in Washington, a number of us working on the McGovern-Hatfield Amendment and the war uh, in the uh, spring of 1970. And by that time, it was also fairly obvious that uh, rather than uh, protest solely in the streets, that there were political alternatives. And for me and for many of you in this room, that was the McGovern for President campaign of 1972. I uh, Just one story about that. I was, uh, among the many things I did in that campaign, I was uh, the representative for Senator McGovern on the platform committee. Some of you may remember that was the first year the Democratic Party held regional hearings around the country prior to the convention. So we held platform hearings all over the country. And, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, as I remember, Sioux City, Iowa, New Orleans, San Francisco, Pittsburgh, uh, and so on. And one night we were in New Orleans, and Dick Neustadt, a uh, Harvard professor, was the temporary chairman of that platform committee. And we were all meeting him, mean, the Wallace people, the Humphrey people, everybody was, we were all pals by then. And uh, so we were all going out to dinner together, and we met in, in Neustadt's uh, hotel room to, to uh, go from there for dinner. And, and Neustadt was... Uh, on the phone back to the office of the DNC, and so he was talking and getting messages and everything like that, and at the very end he said, what, what? Well, I'll be damned. And then he hung up the phone, and we all left the room and headed for the elevator, and he was giving us messages, and then I said, well, what was that last part about? And he said, oh, it's the damnedest thing I ever heard of. They caught five guys breaking into the Watergate last night. Um, so at any rate, that was, uh, th 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 that was some of uh, my perspective on those years. And now to tell us what was really happening during that campaign and during those, those uh, years, we have two professors. Um, Bill Brands was uh, introduced to you this morning by uh, Professor Schlesinger. Uh, he is at Texas A&M University. Uh, he has a, uh, he's done a lot of work on LBJ. He has a book coming out on TR in a few months. And then after him, we'll hear from Randall Woods, who's a professor at the University of Arkansas. Uh, who's going to talk about McGovern and the anti-war movement. And uh, Professor Woods has written a book on Bill Fulbright and has a, is now at work on a one-volume work on um, LBJ. So, Professor Brands. Thank you, Vern. One of the reasons I went into history, uh, rather than political science or journalism, is that uh, I wasn't sure that I wanted to deal with the subjects of my investigations talking back to me. Um, now I find myself uh, being preempted by the subject of my investigation, uh, who, <clears throat> who explained why he did the things that I'm going to try to explain that he did. <laughs> well, be that as it may, um, I'm going to be talking about McGovern and LBJ. The Vietnam War didn't have to tear the Democratic Party apart. If George McGovern and Lyndon Johnson had had their way, it wouldn't have. But the war unleashed passions that were larger than either man, which is saying something, uh, obviously in the case of the flamboyantly volcanic Johnson, uh, but no less surely in the case of the quietly determined McGovern. And McGovern and Johnson found themselves caught in a riptide that left one half of the party stranded on the beach, while the other was swept out to sea. Of course, the rending wasn't confined to the Democratic Party, that same riptide ran right through the American body politic as a whole. In certain respects, then, the story of McGovern and LBJ is the story of the modern Democratic Party, of post-war liberalism, and of the precarious nature of the consensus on, wh on which America's end of the Cold War rested. But it's also the story of how two men who couldn't have disagreed more strenuously on the defining issue of their day could do so civilly, even constructively. And therein, I think, lies the lesson for our day. The story begins in 1960. McGovern was a representative from South Dakota who had two immediate goals. The first was to win election to the Senate. The second was to get John Kennedy nominated and then elected to the presidency. Johnson, the Senate majority leader from Texas, had a single overriding goal, to win the nomination and then the presidency for himself. Obviously, these two sets of goals weren't entirely compatible, but McGovern and Johnson, being practical politicians, found enough common ground between them for productive collaboration. Indeed, in June 1960, 
Some sizable acreage of that common ground was located along the Missouri River in South Dakota, where the congressman and the senator each swung a shovel to kick off construction of the Big Banded Dam, the last in a chain of great multiple purpose flood control irrigation power projects that span the geography of the upper Missouri Valley and the history of public works back to the beginning of the century. McGovern introduced Johnson in the warmest terms. Quote, speaking not simply as a member of his political party, but as a student of American history, McGovern said, I regard Lyndon Johnson as the most masterful Senate leader in our national history. In a technique he would employ again in 1968, then on behalf of Bobby Kennedy, he went on to clap Johnson on the back without quite embracing him. If events should bring Senator Johnson into the White House, he would go down in history as one of our greatest presidents. When McGovern entered these remarks into the congressional record, along with Johnson's speech on the occasion, Johnson responded in kind. I cherish your regard for me, he wrote. I hope you know that I want to do everything I can to reciprocate your warm friendship. Johnson offered to campaign for McGovern, but knowing that he and Kennedy weren't the most popular men in McGovern's home state, he declared, George, I'll come to South Dakota and campaign for you or against you, whichever you think will get you the most votes. Between the fours and the against, McGovern narrowly lost his Senate bid in what turned out to be a very Republican season in South Dakota. This left him prospectively without a job. Naturally, he began casting about, and one of his casts landed on Johnson's desk. Dear Lyndon, he wrote, while those, recur while those returns from Cook County were still steaming, congratulations on your magnificent victory. The election of you and Senator Kennedy made it possible for South Dakota to rejoice, even while we were suffering a personal defeat. McGovern went on to signal his availability. I should like you to know that I would be honored to fill any role in the new administration which you gentlemen think I am capable of handling. Johnson was willing. The loss of George McGovern to the Senate is, I think, a really serious one, he commiserated. I regret it more than I can say. He went on. Nevertheless, I know your efforts on behalf of our party and our country are only beginning, and that you and I will be working together on many matters in the days to come. McGovern wanted to be Secretary of Agriculture, and many influential supporters wanted him to get the job. But Orville Freeman had greater pull, and McGovern wound up as Director of the Food for Peace program, as we heard earlier. Uh, although he remained in this job for just two years, his interest in foreign aid, especially food and agricultural aid, lasted throughout his career. And in this area, he and Johnson generally saw eye to eye. Not always, by any means. After Johnson became president and McGovern won election to the Senate, McGovern took exception to what he and many other liberals saw as Johnson's strong arming of India during that country's famine crisis of 1965-66, when Johnson kept India on what was called a short tether in aid in order to encourage reforms of the Indian agriculture and distribution system. The experience frayed many nerves. Johnson grumbled in his memoirs about McGovern's criticism of his India aid policy, but it turned out well in the end when India agreed to to reforms that did indeed contribute to that country's eventual self-sufficiency in food, and Johnson released the wheat he had been holding back. Other issues between the two men were more complicated. Johnson was pleased at McGovern's Senate victory in 1962, and he threw out the hospitality mat at once. Welcome to Washington, he declared. Lady Bird and I are looking forward to seeing you in the coming year. The vice president invited the freshman senator to a reception at his house on 52nd Street. Come early and stay late, he insisted. The good feeling remained when Johnson assumed the presidency 11 months later upon Kennedy's assassination, and it disposed McGovern to support the new president nine months after that when Johnson laid the Tonkin Gulf Resolution before Congress. McGovern was already voicing reservations regarding American policy in Vietnam, but during the summer of 1964, party solidarity in the face of the hardline candidacy of Barry Goldwater dictated closing ranks behind the president. With some misgivings, McGovern accepted the assurances of the administration and J. William Fulbright, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, that the measure was necessary to demonstrate the resolve of the United States to resist aggression in Southeast Asia. McGovern would later call his vote on the Tonkin measure, quote, the vote I most regret. I should have known better, he lamented. McGovern's support for the president remained solid through the election that autumn. Lyndon is no longer trying for just 50 states. Now he's going for overkill. McGovern declared in a campaign press release. Pointing to four farm bills that had passed by a dozen votes or less in the House, he went on, and we need a little more overkill capacity in Congress. Well, overkill is what the Democrats got in the 1964 election, perhaps more than was good for them or the country. Fortified by his landslide victory, Johnson escalated the war in Vietnam shortly after his January 1965 inauguration. 
Sustained heavy, heavy bombing began in February, followed by a major increase in American ground forces during the second half of the year. McGovern's misgivings grew, but he didn't want to break with the administration without giving Johnson a chance to defend his actions. He called the White House in March to request a meeting with the president. Johnson aide Bill Moyers urged the president to talk to the senator. Bill thinks this would be helpful, Jack Valenti explained to Johnson. McGovern will be making a lot of speeches in the next few weeks. McGovern arrived for the Oval Office meeting with a prepared position paper, but Johnson cut him short. Don't give me another goddamn history lesson, he said. I've got a drawer full of memos from Mansfield. I don't need a lecture on where we went wrong. I've got to deal with where we are now. During the next half hour, McGovern managed to make his principal points. The administration, he said, like its predecessors, was seeking military solutions to what it based was a political problem. The United States should set aside its emphasis on alliances and concentrate on building up the non-aligned states of Southeast Asia. At the moment, the president had the support of the American people, but this wouldn't last if the country maintained its present course in Vietnam. The president should seek a negotiated settlement, one that would appeal to the same noble sentiments that undergirded his campaign for civil rights at home. This was where the administration and the country could put American ideals into effect. Johnson would have liked nothing better than to agree, but he simply didn't think that, didn't think that negotiations would produce a satisfactory settlement. Yet he seems to have impressed McGovern that he sincerely desired peace. Uh, this impression, or maybe it was the lobbying of Arthur Schlesinger and others, persuaded the senator not to attack the administration for its dubious handling of certain aspects of the Dominican crisis during the spring of 1965, even as other Democratic senators and leaders, notably Fulbright, were bailing out. Without minimizing his differences with the administration on Vietnam, McGovern still managed to sound supportive. In September 1965, he delivered a strong speech affirming Johnson's policies. Now, to be sure, the largest part of the speech lauded Johnson's handling of domestic affairs, the Medicare bill, the Elementary and Secondary Education Act, the Voting Rights Act, to name only the most recent measures sponsored by the administration, represented what McGovern called a more outstanding legislative record than any other president in our national history, including the heretofore unmatched 100 days of the late President Roosevelt. The historian in McGovern wasn't content to confine himself to American history. He approvingly quoted a remark by Max Lerner regarding Johnson that, quote, nothing like his magnitude and effectiveness as a lawmaker has been seen since Hammurabi. And sometimes I wonder whether even the man from Babylon could have kept up the pace of the man from Texas. Regarding foreign affairs, McGovern averred that the problems the nation faced in that arena were more complex and less responsive to the leadership of any single head of government. He acknowledged that he had not agreed with everything Johnson had done regarding Southeast Asia. Quote, but we all know that the president is working tirelessly to find a satisfactory solution to the tragic war in Vietnam and to end other threats to world peace. I have never doubted the president's commitment to peace, and I believe that when the full record of his administration is in, it will be a record on the side of peace, including an end to the war in Vietnam. Johnson read McGovern's remarks as carefully as he read everything that was said in his old stomping ground, and in this case, he liked what he read. He directed Larry O'Brien to relay that he was, quote, deeply grateful for McGovern's support. Three months later, he took the occasion of a dinner given in honor of McGovern to send congratulations, quote, I fully share the pride which must warm the hearts of your fellow South Dakotans as they honor you tonight, and I look forward with confidence to our continued association in America's behalf. But the association, at least the kind Johnson desired, wasn't to last. Early in January 1966, following a personal visit to Vietnam, McGovern informed the White House that he was going to give a speech in the Senate criticizing administration policy. Johnson tried to head off the attack. I do want you to know once more, the president replied, that there is literally no place I would not go and no person I would not meet in the interest of a decent and peaceful settlement in Vietnam. But McGovern was not to be deflected. He challenged the central premises of the bombing campaign, currently in temporary abeyance, citing several reasons why bombing was counterproductive. In the first place, it was obviously failing to halt the flow of troops and supplies from the north to the south. Second, it cost America dearly in lives lost and pilots captured. Third, it tended to unite the North Vietnamese behind their government. Fourth, it was blackening America's reputation around the world. McGovern went on to attack the fundamental premises of the war effort. He denied that Vietnam was vital to American interests, and he quoted such military experts as Matthew Ridgway and Douglas MacArthur regarding the folly of fighting a land war in Asia. The United States had reached a crucial turning point, he declared. Quote, the war in Vietnam will either begin to move this year toward a peaceful re resolution, 
however slow and uncertain the road, or it will degenerate into a deepening morass that may claim the lives of our sons and the sons of Asia for years to come. Yet, even in distancing himself from administration policies, McGovern took pains to credit Johnson's motives. I am deeply grateful, he said, to President Johnson, who carries the heaviest burden of us all, that he has stopped the bombing of North Vietnam in spite of the objections of some of his advisors. I am deeply grateful, too, for the President's vigorous efforts in recent days to find a diplomatic breakthrough. McGovern quoted a statement by Johnson, reiterating the President's desire for peace, and he concluded, I have the faith to believe that however difficult the task, President Johnson has the will and the capacity to achieve this purpose and achieving it to win that high place in history, that blessing of immortality reserved for those who make peace among men and nations. Again, Johnson was listening when McGovern spoke. The senator's speech sent the administration into full damage control mode. Johnson ordered the Pentagon to formulate a rebuttal. As Jack Valenti explained in a memo to Robert McNamara, which included a copy of McGovern's speech, quote, the president wanted you to have it and to get answers to each of these assertions and suggestions so that we can be able to answer them. Although the press made much of this break in Democratic ranks, McGovern quietly informed the White House that rumors of his defection were greatly exaggerated. He had been quoted in Newsweek as questioning the administration's peaceful intentions. This, he said, was utterly untrue. I have never made any such statement, he told Bill Moyers. I think the administration's peace offensive is genuine. I applaud it, and I will support it in every way I can. Here he added a qualifier that probably vitiated his disclaimer when Johnson read it while, of course, reserving my own independent views on the Vietnam problem as a whole. Yet he concluded with another affirmation of support. Let me express my deep appreciation to the president and to those of you around him for what I believe to be a thoroughgoing and genuine effort to reach a peaceful settlement. Yet for all his avowals of faith and the president's sincerity, it was becoming increasingly obvious to McGovern that the administration's approach to Vietnam was fundamentally and tragically misguided. I'm just appalled by LBJ's handling of Vietnam, he told Drew Pearson. It seems to me to be the most incredible and monstrous mistake in our national history. He added, perhaps with some regret at his own actions, who would have guessed it in the 1964 presidential race? With the passing months, the president and the senator drifted farther apart. McGovern received no further invitations to the White House, although he had the feeling that Johnson was keeping track of him, as indeed Johnson was. The boss gets wild about him sometimes, Harry McPherson observed to Joseph Califano. Johnson took every opportunity to parry McGovern's thrust against administration policy. In September 1967, McGovern inserted in the con into the congressional record a letter from Northwestern University economist Robert Eisner opposing a tax increase to cover the cost of the war in Vietnam. The administration responded via a letter from Gardner Ackley, the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, explaining why Eisner was wrong. Ackley added, it is not my purpose to argue with you or Eisner about the merits of the Vietnam War. However, I do feel very strongly that to advocate bad fiscal policy as a means of protest against the war is a disservice both to legitimate protest and to sound economics. A month later, the White House caught wind of reports that McGovern was trying to discourage attendance by top administration officials at a conference in Rapid City sponsored by the Democratic National Committee. Quote, I assume he is to be present for the meeting, a skeptical Devere Pearson remarked of McGovern. Whether or not he has been trying to push us out, it would seem dangerous to leave the meeting to his tender mercies for a defense of administration policies. Well, the meeting in question wasn't left entirely to, to McGovern's tender mercies. Interior Secretary Stuart Udall held up the administration's end. By itself, this didn't assuage White House fears, especially since the highlighted speaker, invited at McGovern's special request, was Eugene McCarthy. What did alleviate administration fears, at least somewhat, was McGovern's unexpected announcement of support for Johnson's reelection in 1968. The announcement was unexpected. The fact of McGovern's support was not. Not surprisingly, the question of a challenge to Johnson's reelection from within the Democratic Party preoccupied the White House as opposition to the war mounted. Various liberal individuals and groups were organizing around plans to dump Johnson in 1968. Whether these would amount to anything kept administration staffers awake nights and with their ears to the ground days. But as of the middle of 1967, White House officials judged that opponents of the war really had nowhere else to go, as the cooler heads among them would surely recognize. 
To the extent that the peace movement made inroads among Democrats, the Republicans would be less inclined to nominate a candidate determined to end the war. The GOP frontrunner at the moment was Richard Nixon, hardly a peacemonger. Did the peaceniks want to elect him? For this reason, the White House wasn't particularly worried. Robert Kennedy had been criticizing the president's handling of the war, especially the draft. But a memo from the White House staff to Johnson in August 1967 predicted that Kennedy would go into New Hampshire and campaign, quote, against the draft and for President Johnson. The memo went on, quote, any other dump Johnson moves within the Democratic Party will hurt the peace efforts because no responsible delegates would allow their names to be connected with the drive against a Democratic president. George McGovern, according to this memo, fit the profile. White House staffers had reason to believe that McGovern, along with Wayne Morse, was behind a recent retreat of the Americans for Democratic Action from a dump Johnson feeler put forward earlier. It reflects their feeling, this memo declared, that personal attacks on the president would be politically disastrous. The Tet Offensive knocked all bets off the table. Half the country, it now seemed, thought Johnson's policy was too rigidly aggressive, and the other half thought it was too flaccid. But almost no one thought it was right. All of a sudden, McCarthy's challenge didn't seem quite so quixotic, as became apparent in New Hampshire. Johnson's March 31 announcement that he would not seek re-election suddenly opened the field to anyone who might want to jump in. A free-for-all impended. Another man might have gloated that the president had been driven from office, and plenty did, but McGovern quickly set to work trying to hold the party together. In a Sioux Falls speech in which he endorsed Bobby Kennedy without actually endorsing him, McGovern inserted a line lauding the president, quote, may I add that President Johnson has taken on new stature and dignity by the, mag by the magnanimous manner in which he placed his view of the Vietnam issue above his desires for re-election. Johnson appreciated the gesture. Six months later, after the worst summer and fall the Democratic Party had suffered in living memory, Johnson sent McGovern a note of congratulations on his reelection. And McGovern responded in kind, quote, as you come to the end of your presidential service, I do wish you and your family Godspeed in the years ahead. Four years later, the positions of the two men were reversed. Johnson led the Democrats into the election campaign of 1972 excuse me, McGovern led the Democrats in the election campaign of 1972, Johnson watched from the sidelines at his ranch in the Texas Hill Country. Considering the central anti-war theme of his candidacy, many observers expected McGovern to keep his distance from Johnson, and vice versa. Many who didn't know Johnson guessed that he wouldn't want anything to do with a man whose campaign focused on a repudiation of the centerpiece of Johnson's foreign policy. But those who knew Johnson recognized that his loyalty to the Democratic Party ran deeper than his antipathy to the communists of North Vietnam. I believe the Democratic Party best serves the needs of the people, Johnson declared after McGovern won the nomination. I believe that when I entered public life, I believe it today. Therefore, I intend to support the 1972 Democratic ticket. I shall vote for George McGovern and Sergeant Stryver for President and Vice President of the United States. The former president didn't disguise the, quote, widely differing views he and the nominee had, especially on foreign affairs, but that needn't prevent cooperation. Quote, the Democratic Party can, com uh, can accommodate disagreement. The senator, uh, senator and I can be candid about our differences without being at cross purposes in our objectives. When McGovern visited the ranch a few days later, Johnson was characteristically more candid. I know you think I'm crazy as hell on Vietnam. I think you are. So let's omit that. Instead, let's talk politics which is exactly what they did, and which, as I said at the beginning of my remarks, is the moral of their story. Thank you. I'm very glad to uh, be invited to participate in this conference. It, it's been very profitable uh, for, for me, particularly lunch uh, with Senator McGovern and, and Senator Bob Dole and, and the other distinguished uh, guests. Um, I teach at the University of Arkansas, the main campus is in Fayetteville, and uh, President Clinton recently decided to locate the Presidential Library in Little Rock, which is not the main campus. So I uh, feel that I had a free hand. So I approached Senator Dole informing him of this and asking him if he would consider donating his papers to the University of Arkansas. <laughs> he said he'd take it under consideration. 
The activist foreign policies of the post-World War II uh, period that produced the war in Southeast Asia were a product of the melding of conservative anti-communists who defined national security in terms of bases and alliances and who were basically xenophobic and liberal reformers who were determined to safeguard the national interest by exporting democracy and facilitating overseas economic development. George McGovern played a key role in breaking up that unholy alliance, in destroying the consensus that supported U.S. involvement in Vietnam. McGovern's descent from the war uh, in Southeast Asia and his critique of America's Cold War policies were products of his education, his unique personal traits, the era in which he lived, and the political culture that nurtured him and served as a vehicle for his ambition. George McGovern comes from a long line of prairie dissenters. Robert La Follette, William Bora, Gerald Nye are among the more noteworthy. He shared the populace and progressives' fear of concentrated wealth and private monopolies. His PhD dissertation at Northwestern was a scathing indictment of coal mine owners in the events leading up to the Ludlow Massacre in Colorado in 1914. It's hardly surprising then uh, that the junior senator from South Dakota became an adamant foe of the military industrial complex. In a speech in the Senate on August uh, 2, 1963, he proposed a reduction of $5 billion in a military budget of $53.6 billion. It's hard for us to believe, to realize in the post-Cold War period how inflammatory uh, that proposal was. Beginning in 1969, McGovern acted as a vociferous and relentless critic of the proposed anti-ballistic missile system then being pushed by the Nixon administration. Like J. William Fulbright and other anti-imperialists, he argued that the continuing buildup of nuclear stockpiles far beyond the point where the major adversaries in the Cold War could wipe each other out was absolutely absurd. McGovern's vehement opposition to the war in Vietnam even led him to embrace a version of the Merchants of Death thesis. It seems to me wrong that while some Americans risk their lives on the battlefield, he observed in 1968, a few turn extremely generous profits by supplying the weapons of war and by exerting political pressure for newer, bigger, and more expensive weapons. Like his progressive forebears, McGovern argued that the political power structure should concentrate on perfect perfecting domestic society, broadening and deeping, deepening democracy, eliminating poverty, and promoting social justice. The Cold War and obsessive anti-communism, he argued, were diverting America's attention from a much-needed social agenda. And the war in Vietnam was eroding the foundations of republicanism. Democracy is based on a fundamental respect for the dignity and worth of human life, he told the Senate. And the funneling of 10% of the gross national product into weapons of destruction was undermining that spirit. He indicted the war in Vietnam for diverting monies, as he put it, urgently needed to re rebuild our decaying, explosive, riot-ridden city slums, to strengthen educational, recreational, and employment opportunities in rural America, to clean up our polluted rivers and streams. It would be ironic indeed, he said, if we devoted so heavy a proportion of our resources to the pacification of Vietnam that we were unable to pacify Los Angeles, Chicago, and Harlem. But unlike La Follette, Bora, and Nye, the junior senator from South Dakota was not a pure isolationist. He agreed with Henry Wallace, whom he had supported in 1948, that the United States ought to share its largesse with the less fortunate of the world. He insisted that the Alliance for Progress, rather than military aid to dictatorial regimes, would diffuse what he called the dynamite on our doorstep, that is, the revolutionary nationalism which was providing the Soviets and Chinese communists an ideological opening in the Americas. On June the 17th, 1965, McGovern introduced comprehensive legislation to put the U.S. in the forefront of an effort to end hunger in the world. As you've heard, it's become uh, the basis uh, of an administration, it became uh, the basis of an administration-backed bill, the Food for Peace Act of 1966. Such a position made political sense from the representative of a farm state, but McGovern went further arguing that the alleviation of hunger overseas was both a moral obligation and a strategic necessity for the United States. Hunger, he said, is the companion of communism. Food is freedom's first line of defense. 
In many ways, George McGovern's critique of American foreign policy paralleled that of the New Left, which was, in the main, a revolt among American intellectuals and college students against liberal politics. Like Tom Hayden, I.F. Stone, and Stoughton Lind, McGovern railed against the military-industrial complex. His argument that in its obsessive anti-communism, the United States had everywhere arrayed its power against indigenous revolution, thus identifying itself with the dying colonialism, paralleled the soft revisionism of such young historians as Thomas Patterson. At times, McGovern even flirted with economic determinism. For those businessmen to whom a large portion of the world represents an essential area for expansion, he wrote, communism presents a dangerous challenge to capitalist ground rules. I have long been concerned, he said, over the growth of huge industries who claim, whose claim to existence and, uh, and to profits uh, has been based on the insecurity that has characterized nearly all of the 20th century. Because of their size, their influence is far out of proportion to their concern for public interest. McGovern's frank portrayal of the United States as an avaricious empire certainly conformed to the writings of William Appleman Williams and Gabriel Coco. He believed, moreover, uh, like other uh, ad, uh, proponents of the New Left, adherents of the New Left, in participatory democracy. He was no elitist like J. William Fulbright. He championed the right of personal dissent, sympathizing with those young men who had to choose between serving in a war they did not believe in, going to jail, or relinquishing their citizenship. Yet McGovern continually refused to be identified with anti-war activities that he believed to be beyond the pale. By participatory democracy, he meant the exercise of the vote by every eligible man and woman, not direct control of the decision-making process by the masses. It was this belief, coupled with the conviction deduced from the 1968 Democratic National Convention, that his party had been captured by representatives of the military-industrial complex, by anti-communist ideologues, and by political bosses that led him to champion a movement to restore the Democratic Party to its grassroots. He took a, a dim view of protests and demonstrations for the most part. In a speech at the University of Wisconsin in the fall of 1965, he branded draft card burnings as immature, impractical, and illegal. Though he participated in several demonstrations, he believed that they were distractions from the main task. McGovern refused to take part in the April 24, 1971 march on Washington. Only persistent effort to secure public support for congressional action to cut off funding for this war this year can, real, can yield a real result, he wrote an anti-war activist in 1971. That is why I have been concerned that so much attention has been focused on the demonstrations and so little on the hard work that is necessary to build solid public support for McGovern Hatfield and other measures. His dissent tended to be private, individual, as a man of conventional morality and conservative personal lifestyle, he feared chaos. A breakdown in the political and social order might very well lead to a disintegration of the moral order. In a 1970 article entitled The Folly of Undisciplined Radicalism, McGovern condemned Tom Hayden and Huey Newton, Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman. What I personally resent most about some American radicals, he wrote, is their willingness to jeopardize the chances of constructive change by flaunting their own foolish and destructive tactics. Religion was a key element in George McGovern's descent. His father, as you all know, was a Wesleyan Methodist minister, and for a brief period after the war, he himself attended seminary. Like William Lloyd Garrison, he believed that man was bound by a higher law. In his 1968 speech against the draft, he reminded his listeners that the Western powers had prosecuted German military and civilian officials after World War II for obeying their government rather than their consciences. In his 1967 Senate speech on Vietnam, McGovern quoted Virgil, easy is the descent to hell, night and day the gates stand open, but to reclimb the slope and escape to the other air, this indeed is a task. Like J. William Fulbright, McGovern believed in descent for descent's sake. America, he said, was not a completed institution a particular geographical location, or even a collection of people. It was a process, quote, a method of liberating the skill and energy of individual men, 
The highest patri patriotism, he declared in 1967, does not lie in blindly accepting the ideas of the past or the policies of the present, but rather in the willingness to question and challenge all that we are and all that we do. In this way, the United States could, he said, correct our errors before they overwhelm us. Open debate would satisfy the intensely conservative desire to keep us faithful to our own ideals. It is tempting, he said, in the midst of immediate dangers and difficulties to sacrifice principles and even liberties to the necessities of the moment. Not surprisingly, not surprisingly then, McGovern saw himself as something of a bellwether, a visionary who would stake out the correct position and then wait for the more politically timid to follow. He was proud of the fact that only he and Jennings Randolph voted for his 1963 amendment to cut appropriations for defense research and procurement by 10 percent. He was also proud of the fact uh, that in September of that year, he became the first U.S. Senator to come out public publicly against the war in Vietnam. In a 1969 speech to clergy and laymen concerned about Vietnam, he quoted Ralph Waldo Emerson. If a single man plant himself on his convictions and then abide, the huge world will come round to him. There is no doubt for most of his dissenting career, George McGovern was swimming against the political tide at both the national and the state level. Like Fulbright, McGovern detested Joe McCarthy and McCarthyism. Despite his fundamentalist religious upbringing, or, or perhaps because of it, the South Dakotan distrusted individuals who claimed to hear the voice of God whispered in their ear, and distrusted true believers who placed ideology above human life. McCarthy was a pure opportunist, he realized, but those who flocked to his banner were anti-communist zealots, intolerant, xenophobic, ignorant. It was they who constituted the real threat to his American way of life. Thus did he regard his 1960 senatorial contest against the red-baiting Carl Munt as a contest between good and evil. In a 1966 Senate speech, he quoted Learned Hand, the spirit of liberty is the spirit which is not too sure that it is right. The spirit of liberty is the spirit which seeks to understand the minds of other men and women. The spirit of liberty is the spirit which weighs their interests alongside its own without bias. Like so many other anti-war activists, McGovern, McGovern was inspired and instructed by the Civil Rights Movement. On the issues of full citizenship and equality of opportunity for African Americans, he was a liberal, although his liberalism was based more on moral conviction and political ideology rather than on first-hand experience. South Dakota, if I'm not mistaken, is not home to a large number of penniless black sharecroppers or impoverished ghetto dwellers. The junior senator observed to the New York uh, State Young Democratic Convention in 1964 that, quote, the Negro people have set in motion a moral revolution based on the Judeo-Christian ethic and the politics of Jefferson and Lincoln. McGovern insisted that the black community's commitment to nonviolent civil disobedience stemmed from its American experience, from the philosophy of Henry David Thoreau, and most important, from three centuries of suffering and powerlessness. Citing James Baldwin's notes of a native son, McGovern insisted that, quote, the frustration that drives the Negro into the streets, the lunchrooms, and the bus terminals is a desperate act of caring about the American ideal. Indeed, he noted with enthusiasm that black writers and activists were calling upon America to come home, to return to the ideals that had been the mainsprings of political and social life since the, since the revolution. Throughout his dissent against the war in Vietnam, and more specifically in 1972 during his presidential campaign, McGovern would echo that call. In 1966, he quoted Baldwin again, what time will bring, what time will bring Americans is at last their own identity. McGovern believed that rabid, rabid anti-communism and the war in Vietnam was robbing the country of that identity. George McGovern, is a liberal who wanted to promote social justice, democracy, equality of opportunity, and civic responsibility by hewing to the principles embedded in the New Testament, the Constitution, and the Declaration of Independence. He is a conservative who believed that zealous anti-communists, the military-industrial complex, and political opportunists were radicalizing the country, driving it away from its founding principles. In the aftermath of a 1971 campaign swing, McGovern expounded to aid Pat Donovan. 
Quote, the greening of America is such an exciting book. What it all boils down to are the simple old values that my father and my Sunday school teachers taught me 40 years ago. It's the best in the Judeo-Christian ethic out of which come the American Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights. Consciousness too, one of the chapters in the book, tells what the youth rebellion is all about. What the kids are saying to us is, why don't you live up, why don't you live in the spirit of the New Testament? And why don't you reaffirm the great ethical values of the Old Testament? Why don't you live up to the concepts of the Declaration of Independence and the Bill of Rights? This is what people are groping for, McGovern said, that sense of their own significance and in relationship to the community. That, I really think, is the message we've got to get across. We know how to reaffirm the ancient verities and the enduring principles of the nation and do it in a way that addresses itself to contemporary problems. The theme of George McGovern's 1972 presidential campaign, Come Home America, is also, I think, a fitting summation of his anti-war philosophy. Thank you. Gentlemen, thank you. Uh, true to the spirit of 72, we're running way behind schedule. Uh, but I, I noticed that Daniel Ellsberg has probably filled up an entire legal pad with comments, and uh, Doug Brinkley promised this morning that we'd hear from him. And so, Mr. Ellsberg, if you could uh, make a few comments, I'm sure everybody would appreciate it. I'm up here without my legal pad, you'll see, or illegal pad. The, um, uh, actually, my comments were not what I was planning to say, but what I was hearing, because I've learned a lot today. I think it's extremely cogent and fascinating analysis, and I was making notes on those. In fact, I do have, I, I feel like responding a little bit to a couple things we heard. Uh, several people have taken Senator McGovern uh, to task, actually, today, in a way that does credit to your friends and associates who would provide such uh, penetrating uh, criticism on your 75th birthday. I'm not sure I, I look forward to that on my 75th birthday. But they were holding up a very high standard. I happen to think the standard is, is the right one. We don't apply it enough of what one might have done, what one should have done, what one could have done, even though it's a standard that they feel that George McGovern failed in some respects. I was listening to that and applying it to myself. And I can answer, I think, uh, in one way, specific questions that have been raised here several times today. Did McGovern know, or I, I believe, that McGovern did not know either what was being planned in 64 by Lyndon Johnson or 65 or reservations about it by anybody in the administration or anything that would have given the lie to uh, Johnson's statements. I, I believe that easily. My answer as to why he didn't know, one answer would be, I didn't tell him. And for that I feel quite responsible. Now, McNamara could have told him, as someone suggested. Others could have told him in a better position as I, but actually, I was in a good enough position. My safe in the Pentagon as assistant, special assistant to the Assistant Secretary of Defense in 64 was filled with documents showing that Lyndon Johnson would almost surely carry out Barry Goldwater's bombing campaign and other campaigns soon after the election. That there was, the American public was being hoaxed by fraud there was no real choice between the candidates on this point. I knew that. Very specifically, I knew that statements that uh, Senator McGovern referred to, that in voting for the Tonkin Gulf Resolution, he was, he was voting for a measured response to an unprovoked, unequivocal attack on American destroyers, <coughs> were plausible for him to believe because he had been lied to by Lyndon Johnson, McNamara, Rusk, and others in secret testimony before Congress, before the Senate. I had the documents that could prove that. I didn't think of putting them out. That's perhaps an explanation or giving them to Senator McGovern or to Mansfield or specifically to the Foreign Relations Committee. It didn't occur to me. But in recent years, that has seemed to me perhaps an explanation, but not an excuse. It seems to me fa a failure of the standards that should be put to American officials in the executive branch like myself. Now, Senator Morse and Gruning both, test, uh, both volunteered in 71 
after I had given those documents, the same documents that had been in my safe in 64, I gave them in the form of the Pentagon Papers to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee in 69, and then later to the New York Times. Senator Morse and Gruning both volunteered to testify uh, in my trial in some fashion. Gruning actually did. But Morse told me in the summer of 71, having read this part of the Pentagon Papers, if you had given us those documents in 64 to the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, which I had, I had in my safe, that bill would never have gotten out of the Foreign Relations Committee for a vote. And if by some chance it had, it would have been voted down. Short, he was telling me that what Johnson used thereafter, with a good basis, as the functional equivalent of a declaration of war, would not have existed at that point if I had simply done what I now perceive a few years later and what Morse showed me. I clearly should have done, knowing that Congress was being lied to, knowing that the whole electorate was being hoaxed, basically, in a most serious way, and that we were being lied into a war, basically, of enormous proportions, a war that the electorate was about to repudiate when Goldwater openly uh, declared, uh, proposed it. Uh, on election day, uh, November, in November of 1964, I represented the Defense Department at an interagency group uh, chaired by Bill Bundy in the State Department to discuss alternative forms of carrying out the Goldwater policy, which the, elect the voters were that day repudiating in a historic landslide. Uh, we considered essentially nothing that would have meant getting out of Vietnam, only different ways of bombing, in particular. Now, we didn't discuss that the day before the election because it might have leaked. Even at that late date, it would have showed voters that this dimension of the campaign, which was a major one, was a fraud, that there was no real difference between the candidates. We didn't do it a day after the election because there was no time to wait in this chaotic, revolving door situation that they described. The bombing had to get underway very quickly. I was against the bombing. I was there for reasons that George McGovern was referring to in some way. I was supporting my boss, Robert McNamara, who at that time proposed the bombing. I was supporting the president. Uh, I was opposing worse forms of bombing than we actually chose, seemed to me. But I was against it. And as I say, it didn't occur to me to simply tell the truth about that and to unload. So what Morse was, in effect, suggesting to me was that the next 58,000 American deaths perhaps could have been prevented if I had done what I now see I should have done. So when it comes to meeting this standard and saying, I think uh, George McGovern was sincere totally, I mean, in 1970 and still, when, as I heard this morning, to my great interest, he was saying to his colleagues, we have all failed at this point. And I'm, I, I'm sure that he did not mean to exempt himself, even up to that point, though he'd done more than the others. As I say, that's a standard that uh, I would have to say I failed. I apologize to the American public for that. I feel very sorry, very regretful for it. Okay, moving ahead, uh, we both learned from the experience. In fact, we both were introduced to Vietnam about the same time I heard this morning. I went there in September of, uh, in October of 60. Five, and you were there in November, and uh, began to see the war itself. So we learned. And the uh, effect, I'll just move ahead to the end of it. We did what we could. And focusing now on George McGovern rather than me, and that's something I think deserves much more attention than it's gotten here today. We talked a lot about the campaign. Let us say very fast on that. It was seen at the time, and has been seen ever since, as a kind of feckless, doomed campaign, uh, like a demonstration or a civil disobedience or something that had no chance of affecting the war and didn't affect the war. I think both of those things are totally wrong. Had Bremer or someone else, after Bremer, not shot George Wallace, he was going to run. And uh, Nixon had failed in his, what he'd expected to do was to persuade him or bribe him or extort him to get out of the race. Had he run, there would have been no landslide for Richard Nixon. It would have been a close race. And my guess is, as best I can guess, it's a guess, 
is that George McGovern, even George McGovern, uh, in that sense, would have won. Certainly, it would have been very close. I was just looking up the other night. Uh, George McGovern got in 60, 72, 29 million 170 thousand votes. In 68, Humphrey got 31 million 170 thousand votes, 270 thousand votes. Uh, McGovern had 93 percent of, of Humphrey's vote. Uh, 16, you know, we, we perceive the one as a viable, tough campaign, uh, real serious, and McGovern's is impossible. The difference was, of course, Wallace was running in 68. And had he run again, as everyone expected him, as he would have done without shooting, it would have been a close race. Next point, would that have made a difference to Vietnam policy if McGovern had won? And finally, on that point, I want to say, I think the general perception of that is totally wrong. There was a great deal at stake in that election, more than people realized. I believed as of 69 and 71 and later, and all the more till today, with more evidence, that Richard Nixon had no intention of accepting a decent interval in Vietnam, followed by a disguised defeat, which most people to this day believe was his strategy, his aim, and what he did. I don't think he ever accepted that, and anything to the contrary was as much a lie as Lyndon Johnson's in 1964. As late as the spring of 73, after the election of the Paris Accords, I feel on the basis of a good deal of evidence and very close analysis, the war would have continued in the air as soon as the troops were out, that Johnson, uh, that Nixon would have returned to bombing, and that what we had the prospect of was years more, years more uh, air war, U.S. air war in Vietnam, and hundreds of thousands of more Vietnamese dead before Saigon became Ho Chi Minh City. Those were the stakes in that election. They really were very serious. Maybe, I don't know if even uh, McGovern to this day, you know, will, I want to talk to you about it, but I'm not even sure if, if you have that conception. A key element in keeping that from happening, the key, was Watergate, which prevented Nixon from carrying out the bombing that he intended and which Kissinger was proposing at that point. Without Watergate, I think the war would have continued. The other key element was, and Watergate got Nixon out of office, which I think was essential. The other key element was the funds had to be cut off by Congress. That war had to be ended in a way no war had ever been ended in history. McGovern's name, along with Hatfield, is on the bill without which, I believe, the war would not have ended when it did, the McGovern-Hatfield bill. Started by, started by Goodell, a Republican, for which he was hounded out of the Republican Party as the Christine Jorgensen of the Republican Party carried on then by McGovern and Hatfield to cut off the money for the war. Uh, without that, e Ford would have, uh, following Nixon, would have uh, kept the war going, I think, in the air. And uh, with that, with the McGovern-Hatfield bill, the process that led to the cutting off of the funds, Ford was not willing to buck Congress on that. So uh, I've always felt, and I've, I've often felt, I, I wanted to end the nuclear arms race, I've often said, the way George McGovern was crucial to ending the Vietnam War by Congress defying the executive and cutting off the funds. So I thank you, George, for what you learned and what you did on what you learned. Thank you. Uh, I'm afraid uh, I'm, I'm going to have to cut that off. I, I, I'd hoped that we could get some questions here, but I can see that uh, we're, we're behind schedule. Doug, what do you want? We'll, we'll continue and we'll get some taken later. All right, the, we're, we're going to bring the next session, bring the next session on, on to the campaign. Thank you, Professor Brands and Professor Woods. We'll be able to take um, a couple of questions and later we'll kind of combine the, the uh, both, but the people that are taking part in the 72 campaign um, session, can you come on up to the front and make a changing of the guard here in the next two minutes? But it'd be good if everybody stayed seated so we don't lose too much extra time. <laughs>